It's my privilege to introduce to you Greenville University's preacher in residence. And it's only because of some scheduling conflicts that we've actually had to wait until November. But we'll get to hear from David today and next week, and then one more time here in November, and then hopefully we'll get on a more regular schedule next semester. Pastor David T. Hawkins was born the youngest of 11 sons and one daughter. He received his undergraduate degree in business administration from the University of Missouri Columbia and his Master of Arts in Theology from Covenant Seminary. At the age of 21, Pastor David Hawkins accepted the call of pastor at Living the Word Church Fellowship in Collinsville. In 1998, he took over as pastor with two members and a bankrupt church. Through his dedication and kingdom focus, he's seen God grow the ministry to worshiping with over 600 people per weekend. He believes in teamwork for the kingdom and is known to make the work of God lots of fun. He enjoys sports, is an avid reader. In addition to being our preacher in residence, he also teaches our homiletics course. So he's a professor here and he has some fans over here on the side. So please welcome with me our preacher in residence, Pastor Hawkins. Perfect. Man, we didn't do the sound check, so it's always one, you know, it's always that 50-50 shot whether or not it's going to be right, but that's excellent, but I'll keep that mic closed just in case. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It is awesome to be here today. So Greenville, what up? How you doing, right? I am so excited each time I get to come and gather with you. I hope you are just as excited, and I hope you're just as fired up. If you have not had your first cup of coffee, I am it. All right? I will be it on this morning. It's a lot to get to. It's a lot to be said, and I am so, I'm excited to get this opportunity. Listen, I have students in my class that I didn't know have certain giftings. Matt, I'm going to talk really bad about you and good about you. Didn't know he was also a rapper. I'm like, what up? You don't say much in class, but now you're going to have to do a rap before you preach next week. Amen. Can't wait to hear it, Doc. Can't wait to hear it. And when that video dropped, I was waiting on the basses, and I'm like, Poof. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all are, you're still being sophisticated in chapelians, okay? That's the new word for chapel, those who go to chapel, chapelians. And so, uh, we're just excited about chapelians being here. Are you still going to give me that very stoic, stoic look today? Okay, we're going we're gonna to put a smile on your face before today's over, amen? Today, I get the opportunity to talk in chapel, and yes, it has been a long time, but you know, it's the busyness of ministry and the busyness of school, and, and quite honestly, my agent didn't allow me to really sign any contracts, um, and so I'm talking to them now. I'm, I'm a struggling actor on unemployment, so I'm really trying to draw as much as I can from this uh, sabbatical, uh, being that I'm great and all, uh, but I cannot get an acting gig for the life of me, so I'm reserved to be a preacher. Um, with that being said, today I'm talking to you about this wonderful topic called the power of name calling. The power of name calling. Has anyone ever been called out of your name? Anybody? By show of hands. Oh, you have not. You have really lived a great life. God bless you. Well, I remember the first time that I was called out of my name. I'll never forget it. It was my best friend. We were 10 years old. We were on the playground of our elementary school, and I'm telling you, he laid out some words in the form of expletives, and I tell you, I couldn't believe it. We were all around. It was like this gathering of a crowd of 10-year-olds, fourth and fifth graders, and I was like, oh, oh, my God, and he said these words with such poetic precision. I knew that he had upgraded his lexicon from being a child to an adult real quickly. I thought he was faking it, but the fire in his eyes and the passion behind it made it seem real clear that he meant every word he said. And you might be wondering, what did he exactly say? Well, we're in chapel, and I can't tell you verbatim. It would be some issues with our code of ethics. But in some sense of the word, he gave me, if I could use some synonyms to give you an idea, basically stated I was weak, some anatomical male part, and I love my mother a whole lot. <laughs> you get it? Okay, let's keep moving. I sat there in shock waiting for him to be reprimanded, waiting for that wonderful moment where the teacher or the principal walks up at the right time and says, oh, you're going to get it. I was waiting and no one came to my rescue. I sat there humiliated, 
with those words resonating in my heart and mind. And the kids didn't make it any better because they oohed and awed. And all that day, I was that. I mean, even the kids looked at me and they gave me this little look like I was that. One even said it in class under their breath, you mama's boy. It hurt. I learned real quickly that the little poem we had in, in elementary school was false. Y'all, y'all know the poem, right? Six songs may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Lie, 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 lie. That hurt. And the one thing about growing up in this hazing called school life, especially as you're trying to establish your notoriety, your greatness, your, your grandeur, your significance, you, you want to escape all labels that are negatory to your trajectory. And I'm hoping for that clock to hit 3.30. That's when we get out of school. I couldn't wait to 3.30 as I made a bold move towards the exit doors and ran home to have the words linger with me. I went to sleep and woke up to those words still with me. Came back to school the next day and you know how kids are. They pointed at me and said, there goes that kid that loves his mother a whole lot. After weeks and weeks, you thought it'd die out, but the words stayed more distinctive and powerful. They never left me. And now I'm dealing with those words to the point that now, from 10 years old to now 40 years old, I still remember those words. Today I want to give you the powerful truth found in the account of Genesis that I think will help us to understand the power of words. It is this text of scripture that gives us the creation account. It says these words, and I'll read it to you. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild, all the wild animals and the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Now, I need you to use your imaginations for a moment, and I need you to just imagine in a crazy, innocent, seven- or eight-year-old mind, God bringing the animals to Adam. Adam is naming them. Think about that. Hmm. If I could use the English transliteration and use the English lexicon for the naming of the animals, I'm not certain if, if, if Adam was using Hebrew or Akkadian or a language we have not yet discovered. But I'm certain it wasn't English. But he uses these names that we now have uh, transferred over. Imagine when the cow came. He, cow. Yeah, you are a cow. Imagine when the lion came and roared. He just looked and lied. You, li- you lying real good. <laughs> lion, right? Imagine when the parrot came. He says, yeah, you're good at parroting, parrot. Some would contend that Moses, I mean, that, a, that Adam, excuse me, was given a creative liberty to speak in a creative voice. I, I, would, I would contend with that. I, I think that Adam was so connected to God that he knew the function of a thing and he resonated the label with the function. He was so connected to God that he knew exactly how to name each animal. In fact, when we go and study the Hebrew of these words, name comes to light in a powerful way. It it, it gives us this resonating reality of, of what it means in the Hebrew. It's this word named kara, which means to proclaim. So every time Adam named the animal, he proclaimed. He, he gave it its destiny. He named it. He, he, he gave authoritative distinctiveness to each animal. 
But then there's something real funky that goes on in Hebrew and in, in, in Genesis 2. He says these words, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called them. So the word first name, kara, then called is the same Hebrew word, kara. Then it gets to this last component that really trips you up if you're reading it from the Hebrew. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Now that's where it gets tricky. Name. Hmm, huh. name. See, name here then switches up or what he called them. It gets to this whole different thing. It's something else going on. He proclaims and the word called is the word shem, which means whatever it stood for, that was his reputation from that point on. Tiger, you will be a tiger forever. Lion, you will be a lion forever. Impala, for those of you who don't know what those are, let's just think about deer in America. You will be an Impala forever. Dog. I, 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 I would even say that being a dog lover myself, that I think the dog that was there first was the German Shepherd. I just think, I think when he saw it, he didn't say wolf. He said German Shepherd. <laughs> he proclaimed and then he gave it its reputation never to be undone again. The strong implication was that Adam, being one with God, was literally complying each name with the function of each animal. Each name, you can even get a little bit of hysterical and go into the naming of the dinosaurs and the flying animals. Yeah, God brought them to Adam and said, buddy, name it. In such a way, his naming game was so profound and so powerful that when, when Adam got through naming everything, he was also anticipating something that looked like him. And the text of scripture tells us he found no one who was suitable. And so God gave him some night tall, put him to sleep, and he woke up with a whole other human being. Some say that God's best work is done when man is asleep. Eve pops up and Adam is so excited. He sees her and he says, oh, this is a, <laughs> Woo! this, this here. Oh, my God. This, oh, oh, my God. I'm named all the majestic. But this here is now bone of my bone. He can see the incision of God's surgical hand and flesh of my flesh. And she, he said, can I name her God? Can I name her? Can I, na can I name her? Flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called. <laughs> you get it? You ready? Whoa. Man. He knew her function was different than his, and he names her and gives her her destiny for time to come. And the beautiful realities that we oftentimes read over it's this, it says, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. These words remind us that the Garden of Eden was a place of beauty and bounty, a place of completely, uh, that was uh, completely unmarred by sin. Could you imagine? Now, I'm not trying to get personal with your dress-up routine, but could you imagine today in this sinful world, if people saw you naked, you'd be like, oh my God, the shame. Could you imagine Adam and Eve having our sensitivities, conditioning, being in the garden, naked? Oh, the words. Oh, the words. Oh, you. Oh, all the words. You can only imagine when they got in an argument, the, the words that Adam and Eve would have said to each other. Oh, Adam, you look a little bloated today. 
You must have had too much of that vegetable juice over there. If you quit all that running around this garden and come home on time, Adam, you wouldn't look a little fluffy today. The words, it says they were naked and not ashamed. They were disarmed from the realities of painful labeling. There was no shame. There was no baggage. No degradation was attached to her name or to his name. Then paradise is lost. We know the story. Sin enters and then these wonderful D words. Degradation enters. Depravity. Destitution. Denigration. Depletion. Deceit. And one W word. Wickedness. And now they're all realities to this first couple. When we fast forward, we have to understand that's a powerful truth about Adam naming things because he's acting like God. See, God had a habit of people he used, he would change their names. And, and, and God did this often throughout the Old Testament. Like, literally, he would just like, okay, I'm going to use you, but I'm going to change your name. You're like, hold on, my mama gave me that name. My uncle, that's my uncle. I'm Uncle Junior. I'm, I'm Daddy Junior. Dad, how you going to change my name? Because God was adamant that when he changed your name, he was trying to establish a new identity. See, God changed Abram's name, meaning high father, to Abraham, meaning father of multitude, which means the name that we're giving was limited to our destiny. It, 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 yeah, you will be a high father in the community uh, that you were in, Abram, but I have a greater purpose, so I'm going to make you a father of multitudes. What do you want to be, a simple high father without children, or do you want to be the father of many nations? He changed his name. Not only his name, but he also changes Sarah's name. And many scholars go back and forth with how he gets an H in his name. But when you know God's name, it's referred to as Yahweh. That's what he shares with Moses, that Yahweh is my name. What does he give Abraham? He gives him an H. Some scholars say that God loaned him an H from his name. And then he gives Sarah an, uh, uh, an H as well. Her name, before God changed it, meant simply a princess. But when God changes her name, it meant mother of nations. See, if God's going to use you, he has to change you. See, God changed Jacob's name. Y'all know the story of Jacob. I won't go through it. But Jacob's name, uh, you know, he's a son, a grandchild of Abraham. God's going to do some great things through Abraham, right? You get that story? But then Jacob, I don't know. I don't, really don't know how they just going to name their child Deceiver. Like, you know, y'all love your children, right? But I don't think any one of us just names them something that's going to be the, the cause them to be the brunt of jokes, Jacob means supplanter, deceiver. And when he wrestles with God and God pops out his hip, he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob means supplanter, Israel meaning having power with God. I said to you already, if God's going to use you, he's got to change you. If God's going to use you, he's going to change you. In the New Testament, God is not done in Christ Jesus. For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Jesus went around Theos, Andros, God, man. He went around and he recruited disciples, and that was this one guy by the name of Simon. He changes his name from Simon, which means God has heard, to Peter, meaning rock. Which, which gives us an idea of what he's going to do with this dude who now he names Peter, who becomes a foundational uh, leader in the New Testament church. He named him Rock because what he's going to lead, others can build upon it. He names him Rock because what he's about to do, others will need him to be solid. 
He names him rock because of the adversity that he's about to uh, encounter. He has to be solid. He can't be flaky, Christian, get with God as long as the getting is good, the miracles are coming, the bread is coming from heaven, and all of the multiplication of Jesus' miracles are happening. No, he had to be able to handle, except you eat my blood, and except you eat my uh, flesh and drink my blood, you have no part. He had to be able to handle some hard truths. See, let me just share this with you. If God's going to use you, he's going to have to change you. See, how are God's people named, which leads me to this idea that if God is in the name-changing business, did he stop? Did he stop in the epistles of John or Revelation? What did, he, what, what did he stop when the New Testament church gets full and kicking? Well, let me just share with you, I did some research and I'm looking at how Jesus' disciples were named. They were given two names. I named one of them already, disciples, which means learner. And the other one, follower. How can you tell someone has been changed by who they follow and who they are sitting at the feet of and learning from? How can you tell a disciple of Jesus, are they following and are they learning? Take my yoke upon you and Jesus says, learn from me. Which means if we are learners, we have never mastered all of the subject matters. And one thing about students is that you give grace to other students because you know how hard it is to be a student sometimes. Am I right about that? Can I get an amen right there? All right, we're in the house now. I can feel like I can preach it now. When we understand that we are never masters of this thing, we are forever learners and we are forever followers. That means at no point in our walk with God can we just put a stake in the ground and say, all disciples who follow Christ also come to me for greatest learning of all. No, we're all learning. We're all growing. In the first century church, were they learn, were they, what were they labeled as? What were they called was my question. Well, you know that they were not called Christians first. They, yeah, yeah, Christian, it's a, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a label we get proud about. I am, I am Christian. I, I am a, I am a, I am a Christian. I, yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. And no word has gathered so much baggage and has so many layers to it. Because, see, we use Christian as a label. Not as a transformation of destiny or a transformation for destiny. We use it simply to say, oh, that's them over there. Let me tell you all something. You being called a Christian does not make you Christ, child or servant, any more than me pulling up in my garage and spending the night makes me a car. It is a garage, isn't it? then if it's a garage and I stay in it, then I ought to be a car because only cars sleep in garages. And that's what we have used Christian to become this diluted label where if you just show up to church, you got a sticker on your car that says, honk if you love Jesus. (laughs) Or if you every now and then pray over your food and say, in public settings like I hop a Denny's. God, my God, I thank you for this bounty of pancakes and bacon. For without you, God, <laughs> there would be no ability to tip the waiter or waitress. So thank you, Lord. Are those the moments that recognize you as being a Christian? Or maybe the occasional peeking of your Bible in a public setting? Does that make you a Christian? Or maybe, oh, 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 a social media post about the fact that you prayed. Does that make you a Christian? Oh, I go to a Christian college, namely Greenville University. Oh, 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 does that make you a Christian? Well, my mom was heavy into church, and I am saved by osmosis. Does that make you a Christian? 
I, I need to share a couple of thoughts with you because we do research and we want to find out what were the first followers called? Well, I'm going to go forward and just read it. In, it, it says here in Acts 9 verse 2, but Saul, that's the apostle Paul who becomes Paul, but he's now known as Saul. It says these words, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters of the, to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, the first Christians were labeled as people of the way. Hmm. Ties back to John 14, Jesus says, I am the way. Which means if we are followers of the way, then whatever Jesus does is the way we ought to do it. That becomes the identifying factor of the Christian is, am I doing what the way is telling me I ought to do it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is not until Antioch that the disciples become known as Christians, and even then it was a term of endearment. It was a, it was a term of endearment, but also once you were labeled, that was what you were, and you were under threat of being killed. It's not like today. Christian is an upgrade. We use Christian so loosely, we might as well put it on our resumes to get good jobs. I am Bible-believing Christian. <laughs> like so? Is your life reflecting the way? Are you actually looking like who you say you follow? I want to just share with you all that as loaded as the word Christian has become, as much baggage that is tied into this word, I need to share with you all that the predominant New Testament label for Bible-believing Christians was not Christians. It was, y'all ready? Saints. Saints. Yes, saints. It's, 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 saints is this Greek word, hagios, which means consecrated to God holy, sacred, pious. It, it means that we are called to be set apart, which means we ought to look different than what the predominant society is doing and saying. That means if the world is divisive, the church ought to be unified. If the world is evil, the church ought to be good. If the world is a lying world, the church ought to be a truthful world. Let me just come right into your kitchen because I know, the, I know some of you all are having some hangover. And I want to just share this with you all. When it's all said and done, God called you to be saint, not liberal, not conservative, but saints, holy, consecrated, set apart, look like Jesus, follow Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus. Now, now, hold up. If your other labels take more predominance than your label that God gives you, then what you're saying to God is, I don't need you. I just want the benefits from being around you. <laughs> then I'm going to tell you, you're false. You're not real. You're empty. You are a tinkling symbol. You, you are a rusty symbol at that. You are a symbol that cracks on every stroke of the drumstick. And no one is getting a melodious sound from you because you would rather be associated with this or that. But God called you to be holy, ha? saint, Woo! consecrated, what? Set apart, yeah, 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 yeah. He called you to be that. Now, here's the thing I need to share with you because now, as a, as, a, as a steward of the word, I need to follow the trail. Am I wrong in saying that we're supposed to be labeled as saints? Well, let me just go through these scriptures. I'm not certain how fast this is going to come up, but let me just pull it up here. Let's, let's see. Here we go. Boom. We're called to be set apart. Romans. Paul writes to them, to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as what? Saints. Y'all got it. Romans 15 to 25. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. I could go on and on and on and on and give you every scripture that references the church as the saints, not conservatives, 
Did I offend you? Good. Uh, not as liberals. Did I hurt you? Okay, good. Did, did I make you wake up yet? Great. Not as, well, I, my family believes. That. Ah! What does your Lord believe? See, we get so caught up in labeling people. Snowflake. <laughs> we get so caught up in labeling people. You bigot. And we get excited about how we label people, not realizing what we forget is a very powerful truth. Is that when we label something, we are determining its function. And if what we're labeling them goes against what God said about them, we are dishonoring God. Called us to be saints. So what are we to do with this? We're called to be holy. We're called to be holy. 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 Right. I know. We need to make a list because that's what all holiness organizations do. They give you a list and I want to be on the list because if I do everything according to the list, it's us against them. Holy. I want to be on the list. You want a list? I know it. You're hankering for a list. Give me more, preacher. Tell me the do's and don'ts. There is a list and it's actually found in scripture. It's this list that's called the fruit of the spirit. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that list. <laughs> let's talk about that list. Here's what that list says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. <laughs> if you're holy, you, you love. Joy, if you are holy, you're joyful. <laughs> Ooh, isn't that deep already? Uh, peaceful, my God, from glory. This thing is absolutely alien. Peaceful, faithful, gentle, self-control. He says, against such things there is no law. Here's the punchline. In Genesis... It gives us this truth. In Genesis 1 and 27, it says, And God made them in his own image. And anytime I label something that goes against how God made them, or I view them as being a less than, or I look at them as being lower than, I'm telling God that you messed up on this manufacturing line right here. When I denigrate the image bearers of God, I denigrate God. You cannot be a lover of God and a hater of people. You cannot be a lover of God and a degrader of people. That's them over there. No, that's them over there. That's the world system. The kingdom says we're to be holy image bearers of God. So I conclude real quickly where I started. Remember my friend who gave me those wonderful words? One day my father came to pick me up, and I'm running to his truck, and that same friend, my best friend, yells out, David, can you, can y'all give me a ride? I reluctantly say yes. My daddy says yes before me, and I'm like, ah. Oh. He gets in the car, gets in the truck, and you know it's the truck where you got the little small back seat, and you got to push the little lever, let it up. He gets back there. I never told my dad this was the kid that labeled me. I sat in the car in the passenger side, quiet and silent, as we drove to his house. We get to his house. He gets out. He runs up to the apartment complex. He forgets his key. He looks around. We wait for him, and he forgets his key. His mother protrudes out of the door unexpectedly, and you can see the fire in her eyes, and literally she does not withhold anything, and I found out something about my best friend. He, too, was a weak anatomical male part that loved his mother a whole lot. I realized where he got it from. My question to you is, where did you get it from? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are at this moment of both information and conviction. Help us to walk like you. Help us to talk like you. Be holy like you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's my time. Deuces.